2020 is here, which means a flurry of news cycle information that's going to be headed our way this year. From the current impeachment trials to the presidential elections and, of course, the 2020 Olympics. There's a lot to cover, and we begin tonight by talking about the upcoming 2020 presidential elections. What's happening right now as we head to the primary states to vote? Who's going to come out of the Democrat primary? And what's going to happen in November? John Cole, the managing editor of Politics PA, joins us to break down those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm your host, Sam Chen. It is 2020, if you can believe that, and there's a lot coming our way this year. Of course, we're in a historic impeachment trial, and the 2020 elections are right around the corner. And in between, we've got the Olympic Games. There's so much to cover this year on this show, and we're going to break down all of that for you as we go through the year. But we begin tonight by talking about the 2020 elections. Believe it or not, the time to vote is already here. And as voters and caucus goers start voting in the Democrat primary across the country, there's a lot of questions about who comes out and what's that gonna do for November. John Cole, the managing editor of Politics PA, joins me tonight as we begin to break down those questions. John, welcome back to the show and happy new year to you. Thank you very much for having me back, Sam. And like you said, it, it is finally here, 2020. Right. We've been talking Thank about this moment since the first time you had me on in late 2018 or right. mid 2018. So right. it's, we've been talking about this moment for quite some time and now uh, everything's really about to pick up really fast. If you can believe it, it's here. I, I remember when Congressman John Delaney of Maryland was the first Democrat to announce <laughs> and it was like two and a half years ahead and everyone said, oh, so long away, so far away. And to your point, here we are uh, in 2020. So um, you know, we're sitting here at the start of the year, obviously the election is in November. But the process begins now. Um, and in, in the Democratic primary, they're going to start going to the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primaries. Talk us through that process. We all know the November election date. We all you know, know that first Tuesday after the first Monday, every four years, we're going to elect a president of the United States. But how do we get there? Talk us through at least the early stages of this Democratic primary process. Of course. So I guess the first thing we should start off with is that President Donald Trump is going to be, you know, the Republican yes. nominee. He has again. primary opponents. There are. There was but, a few that announced. There was um, former governor of Massachusetts, Bill Weld, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. announced a candidacy months ago. I think former governor of South Carolina, yeah, Mark Sanford. Sanford, but I think he ended his bid already oh, as well. Okay. So, and there was a former congressman in Illinois as well, I think Joe, Joe Walsh, Walsh, who announced, but none of them really gained traction. And right. President Donald Trump has a high approval rating within the Republican Party. So uh, we already know who's going to be on the yeah. ticket for one side. But the Democratic primary, the storyline there has been for the past year or so, I mean, at one point in time, there was over 20 declared candidates. And that's, you know, yeah. and this is people from all walks of life, different p corners of the country, different age groups, mm -hmm. uh, genders, religion, everything. And um, now we're... The field isn't, you know, slimmed down too much, but we're starting to get to the point now with the Iowa caucus this week, uh, following week New Hampshire, and then there's the Nevada caucus, and then the South Carolina primary. Right. They're the first four states in the Democratic calendar, and it's very important to get some victories in those first couple states because it changes the narrative sure. of the conversation. As soon as you win, there's usually a ripple effect, right. a snowball right. effect. Sure. And specifically in the Democratic primary, more so than the Republican, if you win Iowa, your chances are much greater uh, than winning if you're unable to win that state. I believe it's 11 of the 12, the last 12, I think, Democrats who have run for president had to win Iowa. Interesting. I think yeah. Yeah, 11 or 12 or 9 of the last 10, but point being, for Democrats, is particularly important. Yeah. The opposite is true on the Republican primary side, generally. Winning Iowa means very, very little. In fact, usually the winners of Iowa do not go on to win the nomination. So you look, 2016, it was Senator Ted Cruz. Mm -hmm. 2012 was mm -hmm. Senator Rick Santorum, 2008 was Governor Mike Huckabee. Um, but you're saying the opposite is true on the Democrat side. Correct, yeah, I think in the Republican side, it's nearly 50-50, it's almost a coin flip. If you win Iowa, you might have a chance, you might not, like you yeah. said, like Ted Cruz won in 2016 there. But having said that, um, for the Democrats, it's traditionally is more important. That doesn't mean it's going to be the case this time necessarily, sure. but it's important to notch a win in these early states. So again, outside of Iowa, uh, the caucuses, New Hampshire, again, if, if a person wins 
the first two states. If you're able to win Iowa and New Hampshire, then the dialogue really changes really, to sure. do you bec- does it emerge as front runner status sure. and things of that nature. Even for an insurgent candidate, if you're able to win the first two states, the dialogue changes. Yeah. And even though the demographics change from Iowa and New Hampshire, certainly much different demographic wise compared to Nevada sure. and South Carolina, sure. it's still very pivotal yeah. and to also, start gaining momentum there. And the other thing I think is, is fascinating and what I love about the presidential primary process, to your point, every state goes on their own um, until we get to Super Tuesday, but every state's different. And you know, we're talking about caucuses and primaries right now. And obviously the caucus is, is very different than the primary. We, we vote in the primary here in Pennsylvania. We walk in, we take our voter card, we punch a ba- ballot and, and we're done. Caucuses are a lot different. It's, you got people who, who take buses to these large arenas and you're, you're running around to different candidates or circuits or giving speeches, you're pulling people back and forth. And then the, there's a point where it stops and they do a head count. And it's almost mm-hmm. like a straw poll in some way. It's a very, very different process. And then also, when we get to New Hampshire, they have an open primary process. So it's, again, different where you don't have to be registered with the party mm-hmm. to vote. So the demographics coming into the Democratic primary uh, are very different than anything that a national poll might be showing at this point. Absolutely. And I think that's a very good point where, uh, depending on if your candidate of choice is doing well in a national poll, you're going to push that poll out right away and saying, look, this is proof that my candidate is the most electable. But the funny thing is you can't just look at the national polls. It's about the early states, because if you do not do well in Iowa and New Hampshire, some of the candidates have to reevaluate and decide how long should I stay in this race. Uh, Let's go back to 2016 for the Republican side. Do you remember how crowded that field was? And then they started to, you know, the, the, the herd kind of thinned down. Right, right. Uh, you know, but that first debate, Trump was uh, on the stage of, was it like 15, 16 Yeah, well, there, I think there's 10 on the first stage and there's seven on the second night stage. Yeah. So you're talking, again, about like 17 people. Then after the first couple of states, people realized, right. I don't really have much of a chance. Right. And it'll be interesting to, to follow in the Democratic prime right now. For the most part, again, there's still over 10 people in mm. the field. Um, but after the first couple states, I imagine more and more people will drop out. We've already seen quite a few big names drop sure. out. You had uh, Senator Kamala Harris from right. California. Probably the biggest one to drop. Yeah, I think her was, was the biggest name, and then plus Senator Cory Booker okay. in New Jersey, another big name where mm-hmm. in 2016 his name was floated around mm-hmm. as a possible running mate for sure. whoever the sure. nominee would have been in 2016. So point being, those are two big names, and they're both already out of yeah. it. And there's uh, candidates in the field right now that don't have high, as high of a name ID yeah. that are still in. So it'll be interesting to see after these first couple states, will it go down to just five, four, maybe eight? It's bound to get smaller and smaller. Sure. Let me ask you about that. The, we, we go Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. And then comes March, and there's Super Tuesday. 14 states vote at the same time on Super Tuesday. Um, obviously, you need a lot of money to get through that process. Field is very large right now. When you look at who we're, who we're casting as the, the main Tier 1 and Tier 2, Vice President Biden, Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, perhaps Mayor Buttigieg, mm-hmm. uh, Mr. Yang, uh, maybe in, the, in that Tier 2 kind of, mm-hmm. ser- um, even someone like a Congresswoman Gabbard. What did they have to do early to stay in? What, for you, what's the breaking point here for someone like a Tulsi Gabbard or an Andrew Yang, a Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren? I think there's a distinct difference between Tier 1 and Tier 2, though, like you sure. just alluded to. I would agree with your analysis about who is clearly in Tier 1, that Vice President Joe Biden, Senator Bernie Sanders, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and Mayor Pete probably cracks into that mm-hmm. first tier. I know, again, people may look at it, oh, he's the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, sure. with 100,000 people. <laughs> but granted, I mean, this is a guy who, he actually ran for DNC chair, didn't mm-hmm. get it, but he started mm-hmm. getting some name recognition mm-hmm. then. Um, and he's also, he sticks out because he's the only young candidate. Right. So I think there's something to be said. He's one of the only bigger names that's under the age of 70. Sure. Who's, uh, <laughs> who's, uh, he's actually in his, uh, in his late 30s. 30s yeah. yeah. But point being, um, the tier one people, they can, I think, afford to lose maybe the first couple states and still stay on because they have more of the funds mm-hmm. and the higher name yeah. ID. And maybe they could play the longer game. The candidates who are in the tier two, maybe the more fringe candidates, they're not exactly, if they don't have the funds, they can't hang around too long because these campaigns are very, very expensive. So I don't foresee some of these people being in this race sure. past the first couple states. Sure. Again, each election there is typically a person who you may say hangs on maybe longer than they should. Right, right. And, uh, to Republicans who were angry last time that uh, Governor John Kasich sure, stayed in the race. Sure, my old boss. <laughs> and he, he was in there. He did win uh, Ohio, but right, that was right. the only state he won. And there sure. was Republicans who were angry that he stayed in so long. But the difference with him was that he had a higher name ID and he was the governor of an important state of Ohio. Sure. 
not everyone, again, think of the rest of the Democratic field, the senators, the former vice president, right. the mayor, you know, a former, or now he's a former mayor, former South mayor. Bend. Um, they've raised a lot of money, so that's why I think they can stay in a little longer. Sure. But the rest of the field, like you mentioned, your Andrew Yang, he's raised a good amount of money yeah. as well. He's polled pretty well. Uh, former uh, mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg. Bloomberg, yep. Who's self-funding, essentially. Correct, yes. And that's why he'll probably never be on the debate stage. Okay. Um, he was asked this question at a press goggle in Philadelphia. I was at his campaign office opening in December, and I asked him a question about Pennsylvania. But one of the interesting takeaways from that was he was asked, in the Democratic debate, to make these debate stages, you have to raise a certain amount of money. Sure. Well, he's not raising money because he's self-funded. Right. So he's probably not going to be on the debate, the debate stage. stage. But he might stay a little longer because he has the funds, the funds to stay. Yeah. And, and he's to, polling pretty well. And to your point, Super Tuesday, you're playing 14 states in one day. And, and if you're on a campaign, ha having been there in presidential politics, if you're mm -hmm. on a campaign that doesn't have the funds, you're now left to pick and choose what states you can play in. Mm -hmm. and, and you're not able to do – and you're, it's a delegate count that's attached to it. You're not able to perform as well as, say, a Vice President Biden. To your point, John, if, if the vice president or Senator Sanders or Senator Warren doesn't come out of New Hampshire and Iowa with wins, you're saying that that's not doomsday scenario for them? Not necessarily, but it definitely, you'd have to reevaluate your campaign at okay, that point in sure. time. Right now, again, polling has shown, uh, even though it changes, it seems every couple of days, but uh, Biden and Sanders seem to have emerged in national polls mm -hmm. as the two front runners, but again, just looking at national polls doesn't tell the whole right, story. Right. And we're looking at the top of uh, you know the field, looking in Ohio, uh, not Ohio, excuse me, Iowa mm -hmm. and New Hampshire. It's pretty close between those four that sure. I mentioned. And Amy Klobuchar is also pulled sure, right, pretty well so there. But point right. being, if they don't lose there, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Yeah. But if you don't, again, in those first four states, if you don't show real signs of promise, sure. even some of those top tier people might need to reevaluate. And then after Super Tuesday, after, right. after, again, a significant chunk of the country has voted, yeah. then you really have to right. reevaluate and say, all right, what is my path to a nomination? Sure. Understood. John, thank you for that. Don't go away. We will be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. John, thank you again for taking the time to be here. Um, like you said, we started when we started the segment. I mean, it's insane to think that we're now in 2020, that mm -hmm. this is it. Um, we talked about the early states voting in the primary process. Not every state votes at the same time during the primaries. And so there is a, an order here which is going to help determine who comes out of each party as the nominee. And specifically for us right now, looking at the Democrat Party. I want to ask you about another storyline here that is, is very different um, in American history and also with presidential elections. And that's we are impeaching a pr sitting president in the middle of an election season. Uh, president Trump is, is currently in his impeachment trial in the United States Senate. Um, all signs point to an acquittal. Uh, obviously, we don't know until that happens, um, but it does take 67 votes to remove a president. Never happened before in the last two impeachment trials. All that aside, though, there is still a campaign going on in the middle of this impeachment hearing. The, the campaign doesn't stop for the hearings. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of senators uh, involved on the Democrat side. So we're thinking Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, and Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado are all both, or they're off the campaign trail in the Senate chambers for this hearing while we're heading into Iowa and New Hampshire. How does that impact them? It definitely impacts the way they campaign. Uh, a couple of the candidates have been asked about this point blank from mm -hmm. reporters on the trail and in D.C. saying, um, you know, you're not in Iowa right now. You're not talking to thousands of people knocking on doors. You're not, you know, talking to these people. How does that affect the campaign? And Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Elizabeth Warren have said, like, point blank, they'd rather not be in D.C. right now. They, sure. have, they have obligations to abide by, and they know they, they're not, you know, going to skip it. But having said that, they know that it, it could have a negative effect on the campaign. How big of an, an effect, we don't know yet. That sure. remains to be seen. But this is rather unprecedented. Like you said, Sam, we have not seen this before. And I think, you know, if you're a, a former Vice President Joe Biden and um, Pete Buttigieg, I guarantee you're probably, I mean, I don't know if I want to say they love it, but they, 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 have, the, they have the advantage of sure. saying they can have more events now where they're kind of clearing the field. Yeah. Other candidates aren't able to uh, campaign in Iowa and New Hampshire. Right. Now, having said that, in the, in, in the interim, those uh, senators who are in D.C. during the impeachment trials, they can have surrogates sure. of theirs go out and hold events. And by the way, that's very effective, too. So let's sure. I think we'd be remiss to say that. You know, they're not campaigning at all. There's campaigning right. going on. It's just not themselves there. In so, person. of course, I think to the, the, that imagine their campaigns would believe 
that the campaigns would be much more effective if they were there in person. Right. But it is important that to note that there are surrogates, sitting Congress members, former governors, former senators, campaigning on their behalf in these sure. early states. But it definitely plays a role. And um, we'll see how big of an impact it does have. But it's a storyline that has not happened in a long time. Right. And that's why it's noteworthy. Right. Now, let me ask you uh, the other side of the storyline. The impeachment process, obviously, is an impeachment of President Trump. That being said, this is triggered over the situation in Ukraine uh, in their relation to the president and whether the president abused power in asking Ukraine to investigate Vice President Joe Biden. Mm. Throughout the course of this impeachment hearing, you hear a lot of back and forth about Vice President Biden and his son Hunter Biden, whether or not there were indiscretions in the way they, they were handling situations in the Ukraine the last administration. Obviously, Democrats say, hey, the Bidens aren't on trial here. This is an impeachment trial of President Trump. Republicans continuously bring up, what if the Bidens did something wrong? Mm -hmm. Does impeachment hurt the vice president? I think the case can be made uh, for that. I think a lot of Democrats tend not to you know, view it as that, but maybe to the independent voter that may be mm -hmm. voting in New Hampshire. That, sure. Uh, that they, they can vote in the Democrat correct. primary. That's exactly, yeah, we were right. talking about that last segment, and I believe maybe they might have second thoughts about that. I think overall in the Democratic primary, it's not playing a huge role okay. hurting him, but in a general election, Sure. If he were the nominee, that could be brought up, and he, you know he may be viewed as more of a bruised candidate. Sure. That he just went through that. There was a, um, I believe there was a New York Times or New York Magazine piece, very much about this uh, case recently about Hunter Biden and, and how, uh, what kind of an impact this might have on this campaign. I think most Democratic voters don't really see it as a big story, but independents, I can't speak for them, and that sure. would be very interesting to see. Maybe they might think it's a bigger deal, Sure. and that maybe, if you're trying to court those voters who are undecided, maybe that'll have an impact, but right. at least in the primary, I don't think it's necessarily going to play the biggest role. Sure, um, and to your point, I mean, Vice President Biden's part of his appeal is that he can attract those independent voters, and so it'll be interesting to see if he is the nominee, how that plays out. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to our home state of Pennsylvania now with you. Um, Obviously, 2019 led to a lot of electoral changes in Pennsylvania, most notably the southeast region where you're actually from. Mm -hmm. A lot of these counties traditionally Republican, uh, at least in their count, at their county level government. So you're thinking about Montgomery County, Chester County, Delaware County, that are now blue. Uh, the Democrats swept for the first time in some cases since the Civil War. The collar counties, as we call them, have always played a large role in Republicans winning statewide, including Senator Pat Toomey and Vice President Trump, or President Trump, Vice President mm. Pence, mm. does the change, do the changes in 2019 reflect what might happen in 2020? I think to a certain degree, absolutely. Now, I think an important part of that is to note the big changes that happened in 2019, and they're certainly noteworthy. And it's not just 2019, mm -hmm. it was 2018 as well. Sure. Don't forget yep, yep, that the congressional delegation in Pennsylvania is now 9-9. Mm -hmm. And before redistricting, it was a sea of red yeah, in the five. Philadelphia suburbs specifically. Mm -hmm. And now the Philly suburbs are all blue except Bucks County with Brian Fitzpatrick. Mm -hmm. uh, who's, being, not, who's also not a, a Trump supporter as far as we know, yeah. um, has been critical of the president and, and did not endorse the president last cycle. Absolutely, that's a, that's a fact. Another thing is that Fitzpatrick has a primary challenger right now named Andrew Meehan and he is the, quote, pro-Trump pro candidate. That's how he is billing sure. himself. And there was actually a New York Times story that just came out about this last week, I believe, mm -hmm. that's really worth reading. Because in today's Republican Party, if you're not, I guess, uh, very loyal to Trump, there will be pro-Trump challengers to emerge. But point being, uh, back, to, back to the Philly suburbs, at one point in time, it was reliably red, um, you know, Mitt Romney could do, you know, did better there uh, than Donald Trump for the most part. I think we're looking at a political realignment, so I don't know if it's fair to say it's just pre uh, because of President Trump. I think in politics, it's a long time coming. It sure. was slowly happening, and maybe Trump's entrance onto the national stage accelerated sure. that. But we're looking at the Philadelphia suburbs. I think the Democrats' path to victory, if they're going to win, they know they're going to win all of it. They're going to win Philly by such a wide margin. They're right. going to win Allegheny County right. by a wide margin. You're looking at these certain counties that are, quote, swing counties. So you have Erie County and Northwest PA is one of the states that flipped from Obama twice to Trump. Sure. Up around here, in Lehigh, Valley, Lehigh Valley, you have uh, Northampton County that voted for Obama twice and voted for Trump. And then you have, um, I think it's also Luzerne County sure, yeah, that flipped. Yep. But beyond that, the Philly suburbs are interesting because it used to be red. Now it's getting blue. Sure. Delaware County is the one you mentioned since the Civil War mm -hmm. was... Uh, 
you know, Republican control at the county level now. It's all five uh, council people are all, all Democrats. Democrat. Yeah. Um, even a DA is now right. a Democrat. That's right. Ch Chester County's district attorney is now a Democrat. Democrat well. Bucks County's uh, uh, county board is now Democrat controlled. Mm -hmm. And Montgomery County was a little more blue than the rest. Right. Like they voted for Obama right. and they voted for Clinton at the presidential primaries, but still that's even more blue now. Sure. So the Democrats path to victory, they need to really run up those margins in the Philly suburbs. Now that of course is incumbent upon who the nominee will be. Sure. But the Philly suburbs have certainly changed, but then you can make the same case. Tra old traditional democratic areas of Southwest PA and Northeast PA more are more red, red now. Very so there's that trade-off. I guess it depends how much bluer will the, the Philly suburbs will get, and how much more red will the uh, parts of Northeast PA, Southwest, Southwest PA get. Sure. Uh, the other question I want to ask you as far as Pennsylvania's role goes, there are voting changes that take place. And on this show, we've talked about the new voting machines, some of the issues that those have faced. But one of the big changes that I think will not impact the primary, but the general, is that Pennsylvania has gotten rid of single ticket or single party voting, where you go in and you just check the Republican or the Democrat box. Mm -hmm. This is a swing state. This is a state where people in many areas split their tickets, but in other areas are straight party voters. Does that change how the state is going to get played? Not maybe not for the, the top, but down ballot as we go into 2020. I would think so. I don't know. Well, again, we'll have to see how big of an impact it will have. But like you said, I think most in most people's minds when they go to vote in November, mm. they're there most likely for one reason, to vote for president. Right. So it's not. I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on That's that. A great point. But to uh, counties that are either solid red or solid blue, to those voters who go in there and just press the button or check the box. Mm -hmm. For that party, they're not going to have the chance to do that this time because of a law that was uh, passed. It was either late last year or early this year. Mm -hmm. Point being, um, it can have an effect on some of the more down ballot races. So it's going to be really interesting, Sam, to see what kind of role it's going to play. At the top of the ticket, I think it means nothing. But That's the fair. count, like yeah. the traditional counties where they split your, the ticket, like a Bucks County, where Senator Casey and Governor Wolf won by double digits there, and yet they were elected Republican congressman. Mm -hmm. So like, there are certain areas that are they're known for splitting tickets. But a lot of those solid red and solid blue areas, this is new waters for them. Right. They've never experienced this. So we'll have to see how it plays into like the local offices, the state house, state senate, other local offices. Again, we'll have to see how that uh, will play out. It'll be interesting to see when we, when we look back in November at what happened. It'll be interesting to see how many of those, those tickets got split. Absolutely. So, John, thank you for breaking this down for us. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. One quick note in the last segment, John and I talked about Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick of Bucks County. It's worth noting his brother, former Congressman Mike Fitzpatrick, held the seat before him. And over the holiday, when we were on break here from Face the Issues, Congressman Mike Fitzpatrick passed after a long battle with cancer. And so our sincere condolences and prayers go to the Fitzpatrick family uh, during this time and especially as they move forward. And so we're thinking and praying for them. And we, of course, uh, ask that you join us in doing so. John, um, to close out, the, uh, you're from the Philadelphia area. Uh, you used to do sports broadcasting with Temple. You're a big sports fan. We spend a lot of our time talking about sports. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that, that's just recently happened as we come into New Year is we've lost Kobe Bryant uh, in a very, very southern way. Uh, Kobe Bryant, for, for those who don't know, is actually from not far from where you are. Uh, he's from Lower Marion, Pennsylvania. Talk to me both as a, as a Pennsylvanian from that same area and as a sports fan and, and someone who's been in that sports media world. What is the legacy that Kobe Bryant leaves and, and why is it that the whole world seems to be grieving this loss? It's, uh, I think, for sports fans, and it doesn't, it's not really just a basketball thing. Mm -hmm. This was a, a guy who was, uh, played in the NBA for 20 years. Even though he played all of his career in uh, Los Angeles for the Lakers, uh, again, he grew up in Lower Marion. He played his high school ball there. He was a standout star there. He elected to go to the NBA right. straight out of high school as opposed to going to college. Well, you could back then. Correct, yes. And his father played, had a stint with the Sixers back mm -hmm. in the day, so I mean, his roots are definitely there. And it was tragic considering you know, the young age, the fashion in which it happened, the helicopter sure. crash in which um, Kobe, his daughter Gigi, and uh, seven others mm -hmm. uh, died. Uh, you know, he was only 41. His daughter was 13. Yeah. He leaves behind uh, a wife. And uh, I believe it's three other, three other daughters. Kids. All, all daughters, yeah. Yeah, and it's just tragic, the fashion happened. And again, you're looking at Kobe as one of those people who was not just 
uh, you know, well known, of course, in the LA area, uh, the Philly area from growing up in this region. He was a, a, a basketball icon. Mm. And if you read from different um, basketball reporters, they view him as one of the first, you know, international basketball sure. stars because the NBA has really evolved over the past couple decades. Yeah. It went from just being, you know, uh, sport in America uh, that Americans beloved it's become worldwide people all over the world are watching the NBA and Kobe Bryant uh, really I think embodied you know he was one of the stars at that point in time yeah. so I think a lot of people became to, uh, you know, they got to know who he was considering sure. how good he was uh, won five championships uh, three in the early, early 90s 2000s and then um, you know, later uh, 2000s as well, beating the Celtics and such, and the Magic. But point being, he was, you know, one of the best players to ever play the game, being someone who's only uh, 24 years old, I can say. He was drafted in 96. I was born in 95. This man was basically around my whole career. Yeah. And I know the amount of arguments that people in my generation had about arguing who's better, Kobe, LeBron, or Kobe. And this player, um, he was a center of a lot of conversations because of just how great he was sure. on the court. And, uh you know, it's it's something that caught everyone, of course, off guard, and it's a tragedy. And I know everyone's thinking of the Bryant family Absolutely. in this time. Thanks for sharing that, John. Appreciate that. Uh, of course, our thoughts and prayers are with the Bryant family and all those who were impacted by that tragic helicopter crash. That is all the time we have tonight. My thanks to John Cole for joining us. And join us again next week as we break down another issue. I'm Sam Channel. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.